Good morning and welcome to today's version of 15 Minutes of Flame. I'm Robert Phoenix and I apologize for the delay. I've been trying to upload some tracks to the Spreaker system and really to um, mm, no avail to a large degree. Every time I uploaded the track, which I wanted to use as the info, um, it showed up as just playing on the desktop and not inside the library. Those are scant details that you probably don't need to really know about or even understand because they're all trivial in the midst of what's happening right now on the planet. Anyway, welcome to the show. It is the 26th of April and finally the sun has arrived in full force here in South Central Texas. So from here on out, we're going from the spring to summer blitzkrieg in about a week to two weeks and everything will be up in the 90s from here on out. And all of our friends, also known as the genetically modified mosquitoes, although they may not officially be here yet, will be swarming the evening skies looking for a nice little host. Speaking of hosts, Alex Jones, the Alex Jones saga gets stranger and stranger with every passing moment. Every day there's a new bit of, of high strange and oddity and wrinkle and what I think is going to ultimately lead to Alex Jones's collapse. Let's just get caught up with Alex Jones's domestic battle and then we're going to bring in just for a minute here his latest lawsuit, libel suit, which is against a fairly powerful opponent. So Jones is fighting battles on a number of different fronts. His lawyers must be loving this. They're making big bank off Alex. So if we uh, just peel back the layer a little bit on his domestic squabbles, uh, he, he has admitted in public court that by the time he has, was 16 years old, he had had 150 women. He'd been in fights with older men. I mean, so he says he'd gone through all the rituals. This is what he says. I had gone through all the rituals. So maybe they were fight club rituals. Maybe they were sex rituals. Who knows what, what has happened in the life of Alex Emmerich Jones. And that by the time he was 17, he was dating college women. And this was all, I think, in response to like his personal life, his sexual life, and, and trying to establish that he had it all at one point, and then he decided to become responsible. So he's talked about this on a show a little bit, and which is kind of I said, mildly interesting. But he also gives it some context that these were theoretically Illuminati rituals. Now, there was a picture on the internet that went away with Alex Jones and full-on Masonic regalia, which I have no doubt that is the case. That he was indoctrinated into Freemasonry. In fact, I mean, there may even be some testimonial that uh, he is a Freemason somewhere out there. But you notice he never touches the Freemasons. He never touches the Freemasons. He never gets into the Freemasonic con connection with uh, the Kabbalists. And now, really, uh, at a global level, with the new Islamic order. And Islam and Freemasonry are tied at the waist and have been for centuries. So what we're seeing with the explosion of refugees isn't just a an international crisis which was completely created and fabricated but it is an intentional weaponized form of social indoctrination and, and swarm it's just it's just a geopolitical ethnic religious swarm and the reason why it is happening it continues to happen and look what's going on with Trump and Pence and the White House, I mean, they came out with, you know, six guns a-blazing. Trump was just six guns a-blazing in, in the run-up to the election, in the primary season. And he was all over extreme Islamic terrorists, extreme Islam, extreme jihadists. He doesn't use the term anymore. And look, I am not sitting here saying 
that we've got to eradicate Islam because I think it's I think it's a bigger issue. Although it cannot be ignored and it's being weaponized, as I've said, and I've said this many times before, it started off as something extremely minor. And now, because we there's been this stoking of the fires of dissent and the raising of old ghosts from other clashes and other crusades from other times, that this jihad, this global jihad, has taken on a self-generated life of its own with a lot of help from the West. I mean, let's be clear, let's be plain, let's be simple about it. Uh, of course, we all know who's behind ISIS. It's the U.S., it's Turkey, it's Israel, it's the U.K., and it's Saudi Arabia. Those are your creators of ISIS. That's it. So the reason why it's being enabled is because the Freemasons are really into this stuff. And Alex Jones never says a damn word about Freemasonry. Not word one. Anyway, he's in court and he's essentially bragging about his exploits. I mean, this is stuff that kids are going to read about. You know, I have done some pretty wild stuff in my life. I don't want my kid to know about it. Maybe at a certain age when he's... You know, his, Alex Jones' his oldest kid is, what, 12? Maybe. I think he's 12 or 13. I think he's my son's age. And I could I could write a scorching memoir, but there would be stuff in that memoir that might make my son's toes curl. So this is very public, and his kids are reading about it. That's just one piece. Now, the other piece is, is that there was a connection with this uh, guy in, in in Idaho who creates Chobani, Chobani yogurt, which is really horrible tasting yogurt. Horrible. And he's a Muslim and the, he has a plant, a yogurt plant, where apparently he employs a lot of Muslims that come in and are resettled and are resettled into Idaho of all places. I mean, why couldn't they put the plant in, oh, I don't know, say Baltimore, just outside of Washington, D.C.? You know everything about that? Why couldn't they have put it in, say, oh, I don't know, uh, San Rafael, just outside of San Francisco? No, they, they want to basically germinate areas where there is, quote unquote, very little diversity. So it's targeted. Anyway, uh, Alex Jones said that there was some violence that took place in um, Idaho around the Chobani plant, and it could be it was linked to refugees that had been brought over and that were working at the Chobani plant. And it was a big video. And apparently, the guy who owns the Chobani plant didn't like it very much, and um, he's suing Alex Jones. So now Jones is dealing with his wife and her suit. And the reason why the wife is suing him, or his wife is suing him, ex-wife is suing him, not his current wife, who I believe his last name is Wolf, W-U-L-F-F, -F, Vicky Wolf, uh, is because Alex got remarried. He got remarried in January. And of course, there's going to be another woman around the kids. And, you know, the, the mother of Alex Jones is... Children, for territorial, doesn't want them around the new woman, and hence the lawsuit. Anyway, Alex Jones, is uh, his empire is in flames. His alternative news empire is in flames. And not only is his alternative news empire in flames, and a lot of people will say, oh, that's good, great. You know, Alex Jones was a shill. He was nothing but a gatekeeper. And perhaps InfoWars a long-term limited hang, which was established back in the late 90s, is about ready to be shut down. That's a real possibility. But the one thing that's unfortunate about all of this is that Alex Jones has become attached to a movement. And people have been talking about this for a while. So this is not, I'm not breaking any headlines here, but he's become attached to a movement. He's become a figurehead for the movement. And he has not necessarily 
been, how shall we say, uh, the most sterling example of people peeling back the layers of the world that we're living in. Because he goes nuts. Alex will lose his, his stuff. And, I mean, you saw it on that BBC show. You saw it with Piers Morgan. It's just not a really good face for a lot of people who've really struggled in their life to wrap their heads around what's going on on the planet, who's behind the scenes, and, you know, what kind of lovers they're pulling all the time. So now we have this guy who, and we put up, you know, a lot of people put up with him because, he, you know, he'd throw out some really juicy tidbits every now and then. And Alex is actually very funny. And I've said this before, he's got a, he's got a wicked sense of humor. But now what's happening is uh, Sandy Hook, 9-11, the Oklahoma City bombing, they're all being discredited. They're all being discredited because Jones at one point in time or another has said that they did not happen. He's having to walk back just about everything. Which if you're on the truth side is really quite a disappointment. If you're on the other side, you're clapping and, and doing little jigs and dancing in glee. Because now, essentially, what's happening is Alex Jones is being castrated. He's being castrated by his ex-wife. He's being castrated by Mr. Chobani. He's being castrated by James Alfantes and John Podesta and David Brock. He's he you know he should he's going to have to take more to that more of that vital force. He's going to have to do like multiple shots of vital force every day in order to keep his virility up because by the end of this experience with Alex Jones, there's not going to be a lot left. He'll lose, he'll lose people, but more importantly, the whole idea and concept of what we're attempting to do, which is shed light, bring light into areas of really deep, profound, tragic and decrepit darkness will be discredited. And Everything moving forward will sort of more or less, con <coughs> excuse me, um, will more or less be held up to the standard or lack of standard as it relates to Alex Jones. Now, I could easily see, not, and I'm not putting myself in that position, but I could easily see how somebody like myself who lives in Austin, Texas, who might do something similar, even though it's a little bit different, could be held up to the same kind of standard or lack thereof. And here is, what, what are they drinking? And, you know, what's in the water in Austin? Here's another person. You know, and they could just continually go down the line and just start picking people off. Because Jones has been, in many ways, the tip of the spear. And there's a lot of really great people out there who are doing incredible work, really incredible work, uh, that are not uh, being talked about or mentioned uh, in the same breath as Alex Jones. As he's just become the sacrificial goat for the, the quote unquote truth movement. When in reality, he was never really, never really, he, he was the sort of the de facto figurehead, but he was never really the spokesperson. Go back to what Bill Cooper had to say about Alex Jones, and that's all you need to know. And he's been a limited hang for quite a while, and they're getting ready to close the limited hang. I talked about this about two months ago, and I said, Alex Jones, is ready. he's about ready to implode. And sure enough, here it is. Not real hard to figure out. Um, you just look at what's happening and read the tea leaves and watch the guy, and boom. So one of the things that I really wanted to talk about today, which is a very touchy subject, but it's quite important. Oh, first of all, a couple of news tidbits. This is the uh, anniversary, the 30th anniversary of Chernobyl. Did you know that? It's the 30th anniversary of Chernobyl. Um, and Uber, 31, 31 years since Chernobyl. And Uber has promised flying cars by 2020. How about that? As we slither into the Aquarian age with Pluto and Aquarius on the horizon, not that far away, 
2024, we're seven years away. We're in the last seven years, the backstretch of Pluto and Capricorn. And the world is changing and it's changing mighty fast, extremely fast. So what I wanted to talk about today is with the remaining moments we have on the show is um, the Dutch financier, Ronald Bernard. If you haven't found this interview, it's in, it's in Dutch and it's translated, but it is probably one of the most important interviews uh, in the last 30 years. This is somebody, this is on the same level as say Benjamin Friedman. If you don't know who Benjamin Friedman is, I highly recommend you search Benjamin Friedman and find the speech that he gave. Benjamin Friedman was uh, uh, an American. Uh, he was Jewish by birth, Jewish by faith. He was an extremely successful business person with ties that went all the way up to the White House. And Benjamin Friedman became very aware of a pretty dark global agenda that had to do with his own race, his own people, his own religion, and he spilled the beans. Now, I am not saying that, you know, that everybody that Benjamin Friedman is castigating is a bad person, not even castigating, he's just bringing light, light to the truth. I'm not saying that, that that's the case. Just hear me out, okay? That's not the case at all. But Benjamin Friedman risked quite a bit to you pull back the cover. And this happens all the time. I mean, you have people inside the church that are exposing the church. John Todd did it. Um, you had the book, The Deadly Deception, which was peeling back the layers and exposing Freemasonry. And these are all networks of power and influence. You have Kathy O'Brien, who had her expose of MK Ultra in Mind Controlled Slaves. So this is another plank in a much larger piece of understanding what's going on behind the scenes. So there are a number of levels of whistleblowers, a number of levels of exposés, and they're all vitally important. But look up Benjamin Friedman. It's a, it's a kind of an amazing speech that he gives. This interview with Ronald Bernard is right up there. So Bernard was a financier uh, in Holland, and he was privy at a high level to a lot of what was happening in terms of the global network with banking, finance, and then he got deeper and deeper and deeper into the, the grimy sort of gears, let's put it this way, the grimy gears of this uh, luciferic machine. So this is a quote from Bernard. He says, the Illuminati is an annihilating force that hates our guts. It hates creation, it hates life, and it will do anything to destroy us completely. That's just one little tidbit from this interview. That's a headline, that's a, that's a pull quote that grabs your attention, right? Let's read a few other things here. These are, these are just, uh, uh, Irma Schiffers is the woman who interviewed him. So this is one excerpt. He says, one of the things that I found out about found out is about secret services. You think they are there to serve and protect the people, country, etc., but they actually turn out to be criminal organizations. To be more precise, the system is heavily so. We are talking about financing wars, creating wars, so basically creating a lot of misery in this world. So lots of conflict. And I think to myself, if only people knew what the world is really like. Secret services will stop at nothing, nothing. But they also have their flows of money because they're trading drugs or weapons or for that matter, people. All that money has to go somewhere. Everything has to be financed. And Schiffer says, you say if, but you could confirm they are doing this, all of them? All of them, yes. So the entire world as we think we know it is just an illusion we believe in. Absolutely. Been saying this for years. Been saying this since I turned on the switch on Blog Talk Radio back in 2010. That people understood what was going on in the world, what the world was made of, and who drove the programs from the top down, that it would be absolutely terrifying. People would not be able to sleep at night. So, to some extent, perhaps 
maybe it's a good thing, but we cannot get through and get to the other side until we expose this or it is exposed and it comes to light. And that's just the way it is. One of the things that is going to be our best weapon, and I, and I get a lot of, I get a lot of emails and a lot of texts from listeners uh, who, and, and I, when I say this, I'm not going to say this in a way that's demeaning, but their strategy around all this is love and the heart. And when they say that, I mean, I get it. I get where they're coming from because the, the cool thing about where they're coming from is that they'll listen to me or they'll listen to somebody else or they'll read something and they'll go through the material and they will process the material and the outcome is always love. So this is a really powerful, I mean, if you can maintain that and not this bullshit, airy fairy love, you're not this like 24 hour forgiveness love. I mean, it's like really getting down and say, God, look, look at the worms. They're crawling everywhere through everything. And yet I affirm love. Now you do that. And that is a big, big piece. That's a big piece because my sense, my sense, and other people will confirm this. My sense is that they can't handle it. They can't handle that. They can't handle the love. They can't handle the compassion. They can't handle the forgiveness. They can't handle that eternal, everlasting, unconditional, pure love, which is why they hate Christianity, and which is why they want to kill Jesus again and again and again with the ultimate sacrifice being the Twin Towers on 9-11, the birthday of Jesus. They can't stand it. So if we want to, if we want to have an impact, and this is the toughest part in some ways, if we want to have an impact, we've got to turn up the love volume, and it's not that BS love volume, please, please. And you know, some people say, "Well, is it just love, love? Is it just love, love?" It is, and it isn't. It is, and it isn't. You know, I think you have to, I think you have to get there in a way that's psychologically integrated you know where all the dark sort of crevices have been blown out and we're going through that now saturn retrograde in, in sagittarius going back in back in time like what what do you need to clean up what's in there because it's important right now it is really important right now you've got a few months here left with saturn and sagittarius to get to your core, to get to your eternal truth. Because once Saturn goes into Capricorn, it's going to be full on. Full on. Because the forces of Capricorn, a.k.a. Baphomet, will put their plan into action in a very big way. It will be their time. Now, you as an individual will have the same kind of opportunity and responsibility because that same energy, Saturn and Capricorn, is in your chart somewhere. So you're going to have to be responsible for it. Just figure out where it is right now. If you don't know it, just ask me. I'll send you a free chart. You're saying, you know, if you're listening to this, you can email me at robertphoenix.com. Send me your birth time, birth date. I'll send you a free chart. How about that? Or you could go on to any number of websites who provide free charts. Find out where Saturn, and Cap Saturn is in your chart. Find out where Capricorn, the cusp of Capricorn is in your chart. All right, let's read a little bit more here. This is what Bernard says. I was training to become a psychopath and I failed. I didn't complete the training and I didn't become a psychopath. My conscience came back. And the most difficult part for me was because I had such a great status there. I was successful. I was trusted with the people playing at this level. To put it carefully, most of these people followed not a very mainstream religion. So you have Catholics, Protestants, all sorts of religions. These people, most of them were Luciferians. And then you can say religion is a fairy tale. God doesn't exist. None of that is real. Well, for these people, it is truth and reality. And they serve something immaterial that they called Lucifer. And I also was in contact with those circles. Only I laughed because, to me, they were just clients. I'd love to look at this guy's chart. So I went to places called Churches of Satan. Then he goes on to say, yes, in my opinion, darkness and evil is within the people themselves. I didn't make the connection yet. So I was a guest in those circles. And it amused me greatly 
to see all those naked women and the other things. It was the good life. And then at some point I was invited, which is why I'm telling you all this, to participate in sacrifices abroad. That was the breaking point. And this is the, uh, the murder of children. Now, if you go into a lot of the hip-hop Illuminati stuff, a lot of the hip-hop guys get taken into these parties and they're great parties and there's great champagne and great drugs and great looking women and they are handled exquisitely. They get their, you know, their, their, their Jones on and all of these different sort of avenues and venues and they get hooked on it. They get hooked on it. And then it happens again and again. And the next thing you know, you know, they're with maybe a woman who is underage, like maybe 14, 15. This is what they did to R. Kelly, by the way. And all of a sudden, now they're in trouble because they have, and they record everything at these parties. Um, Jamie Foxx talks about this. Jamie Foxx is like at the Playboy Mansion where a lot of this stuff happens. It's totally wired. There's cameras everywhere. So if you're in a room having sex, you're getting recorded. So there are cameras all over the place. If you're in a room and you bed down with a, a woman or even a boy, maybe some of these guys are into boys and that does happen. And they've got the cameras on, they've got the goods on you. And all these people have their goods on, which is really why they want, <laughs> this is why they want pedophilia um, normalized because they all have dirty, filthy pasts. And if the uh, age of children in consensual, consensual sex is dropped to say about 13 or 14, a lot of these people will have their skeletons in the closet come out. Well, oh, look, it's socially acceptable now. There's no, you can't do anything. The law says you can have consensual relationships with 13 year olds. And this person was 13. So, you know, go take a flying, you know, hike somewhere. This is why it's being pushed, not just because they want to continue to experience the pleasure of having bizarre relationships with young children, but because they want to cover their ass. So then what happens with these parties from, you can see this stuff on YouTube with the Illuminati hip hop stuff, is that the parties become more decadent and more is asked of them. They have money that shows up in their bank account. They're living the good life. And then all of a sudden it turns dark and ugly very quickly and they're asked to do certain things at these parties that were not on the menu before so it's like you know you've got the you've got the it's like what is it uh in and out there's the in and out menu and then there's the secret menu okay these guys are getting the secret menu which trust me is not great and if they refuse to participate in the secret menu, then they're, they will be exposed. They will literally be exposed for what they've done already. And then they'll wind up going to jail. They'll lose everything. They'll spend the next 30 years in prison where there's no, they'll have to do the same things in prison, but there's no financial reward. And that's how the, then that is how they will frame it. Like you can do these things here and you can make lots of money where you can do in prison and you can be, Dirt ass poor. So they go through with it. And then it gets darker and darker. And then finally, there's the big moment where there's the ritual sacrifice. Ah, that's what it all leads to is the ritual sacrifice. Because when you have the ritual sacrifice, you lose your soul. And they are on the way to losing their souls. And the soul can be lost. Think about that. The soul can be lost. You know, and, and only through petition and grace and through massive intervention can that soul be retrieved and brought back to the individual. So, you know, this is a very, very um, dark prospect because once you lose your soul, you're done. You are done. Unless, of course, you have that little tiny cloth, which is what Pulp Fiction was about because Marcellus had lost his soul. He had lost his soul and it took a just man in Julius played by Samuel Jackson to retrieve his soul and bring it back to him. That's what, there's a lot more about Pulp Fiction, but that's what uh, it ultimately was about. So this is what uh, Bernard says here. He says, no, no. Uh, and then I start, started uh, slowly to break down. I lived through 
quite a lot as a child myself, and the reality touched me deeply. Everything changed, but that is the world I found myself in. And I started to refuse my assignments within my job. I could no longer do it, which made me a threat. For them, of course, I was no longer capable of functioning optimally. My performance uh, started to shake and I refused tasks. I had not participated. The purpose of the whole thing eventually is that the wor- is that the is that world is that they have everybody, this is a poor translation, in their pocket and blackmailing me proved to be very hard. If I look back on it, that's the, it's the blackmail piece. They wanted to do that through those children and that broke me. I'm surprised that the language Nazis haven't outlawed blackmail. Sounds racist, doesn't it? And this is what uh, Schiffer says, is that you're not telling me something new, what they do also do in politics. Bernard says, if you Google this, you'll find enough worldwide accounts to know this isn't a Walt Disney fairy tale. Unfortunately, the truth is that worldwide, they've been doing this for thousands of years. I once studied theology and even the Bible. You find references to these practices with Israelites. The reason the first 10 tribes were banished was because of these rituals with children including the sacrifice of children. So this is pertinent. All this made me believe because I realized there's more to life than meets the eye. There is a whole invisible world. It is real. You really do talk about a dark force and a manifestation of light. So I resorted to studying theology to make sense of it all. Going back to the source. That's scary because if you dig into that, you find Tavistock Institute and Mind Control, MK Ultra, Monarch, and the like. He says, Bernard, in all those studies and discoveries, I found a document. Okay, here comes the heresy. I found a document that they're claiming is bullshit, of course. The Protocols of Zion. And nowadays, I recommend everyone read the whole of that incredibly boring document. Just work through it and read it through. We are talking about Zionism. Bernard says, yes, of course. If you read the Protocols of Zion and really study them and understand, then it's like reading the newspaper of the daily life. This is true. How from their position of ultimate power and, and ultimate it has literally become, but that is only because people do not stand up for themselves. They do not recognize what reality is. And we have all been programmed. If you dare say that you're against Zionism, then you're branded an anti-Semite. Then you are, they try to, the negative, you can say evil, the Luciferians, Satanists, whatever you want to call it. It is a real entity. I found that what is written in the Bible, and not just the Bible, you can find it in many books. There were real there really has been a moment of separation from the manifestation of light in which a group went their own way and are carrying intense hatred, anger. The people who understand the severity of this are but few because this is an annihilating force that hates our guts. I read that already. Divide and conquer is their truth. Humanity is a manifestation of light. That is the true creation. As long as you divide them based on political parties, skin color, you name it, then you from a Luciferian point of view, use that to suppress the full capacities of your enemy their full power, they can't stand up for themselves. Because if that would happen, the Luciferians would lose. Then this monster, the greedy monster, would disappear. Unite, unite, come together. The entire shit story ceases to exist. That's how fast it could happen. But that is easy for me to say now. But then I was in a period of my life, which I was crumbling. Can you tell us something specific about that? How did that happen? Because you were invited. I started to refuse assignments. My conscience came back. The request evolving children, and I started to refuse more and more. I had a conscience, and I couldn't function anymore. Broken. I couldn't do it anymore. I tried to work through it, keep up appearances. I didn't know how to get out of this. I was trapped as well. Everybody was trapped. This all led me to crash completely. Eventually, my body just simply stopped. The first thing I saw was my mother crying in intensive care. At that time, I didn't believe in anything, but I can still recall how I saw from that corner I was looking down upon myself. You had a death experience? Yes. I was a, I was a train wreck. Complete wreck. I was completely burned out. I crashed and the body needed a year to recover. Because I don't really want to get into it right now. But in those circles, I got tortured physically during my exit time. This was in order to make sure I would never break the contract of secrecy. So I was taken for a certain amount of time. I was treated. All those factors together just increased the stress I was experiencing. Literally, running full speed towards my own end. Do you mean abductions, as we call it? Or programming? No. They exposed me to certain types of torture to make sure you never damage anyone in that world. This is high, heavy stuff, by the way. I didn't realize it back then, so this is all from hindsight. It did have all happen that way. So the end of my life was so extreme that I couldn't handle it anymore. I couldn't handle it anymore. In no way. However, my mind power was so strong that it only happened with and to my own body. That was, well, I don't know what to do anymore. There were no options left for me. So this is why I think, of course, 
that it, that is not true, but wish I had, like so many of my colleagues, taken the drugs and alcohol route. At least my end would have been more gentle because some of them are just dead now. Even though I know uh, there are more straw men walking around, there are still a f there are few still alive whom I knew back then. Most of them are already gone. Well, I was dead too, but I'm still here. Very powerful. You can find this interview in full uh, online on YouTube. And uh, it's an important interview. And the reason it's important is because, not because he was an insider, but because he was able to get through, like, this is a model. This is really a model for the collective experience and the collective deliverance. Because he had to go through that piece where, you know, he was being tortured. Now, I'm not saying we all have to go through the torture. That's not really not what I'm saying. I mean, there is grace and there is the potential for the miraculous, the divine, the transcendent. That is true. But I would say by and large that this is a very, very powerful process because these, these forces do not want to be extracted. If they're extracted, it's the end. And they're done. And they will fight with every single um, breath that they have in order to sustain and maintain their existence and their parasitic relationship to the rest of us, to feed off of us. Because the world could have ended at any given time. It would have been quite easy to destroy multitudes of people to destroy multitudes of civilizations, which has happened over time, but they do it small and fragmented processes. So that part of the body, part of the collective is um, uh, damaged and feeble while the other part is still vital and healthy and can provide some sustenance uh, to the beast. I want to read something to you here. This is really interesting. I got to find it. Where, where is this piece? Um, ba -ba 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 -ba. Okay. I want to bring up a few bullet points here before we sign off. This is a really, I just wanted to drop this here. Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to say these bullet points. And you tell me what country this is. Their bank is state owned, meaning that they do not belong to a central bank. Their bank is state owned. They have no IMF debt, meaning they do not owe money to the International Monetary Fund, who are extortionists. They have oil and gas reserves, plenty of resources. They banned GMO seeds. Banned GMO seeds. Uh, and their population is very informed about the petrodoll, petrodollar and all that stuff. So they have no IMF debts, state-owned bank, plenty of oil, plenty of gas, and they ban GMO seeds. What country is it? It's Syria. Syria. Now, I ask any of you who are remotely alive and awake, wouldn't you like to live in a country that does not have genetically modified organism seeds? I mean, that's just, that's just low-hanging fruit right there. Wouldn't you want that? Of course you would. How about not being having the noose of debt, IMF debt, having the noose of no IMF debt around your bank, around your neck, collectively. How about that? Being energy self-sufficient. How about that? Would you like that? And that's what's going on with Syria. And that's why they want Syria out because they are a model of self-sufficiency and sovereignty. Anybody catch Ivanka Trump in Germany yesterday? She was booed. She was booed. She's the first lady. The first lady was in Germany at this women's conference with Christiane Lagarde. And boy, Angela Merkel is weird. She's looking more and more like Hitler every day, isn't she? Just, just put a little mustache on her. Her funny little hand gesture. She's always doing that hand gesture. It's almost like it's OCD in some ways. You know, I bet you some kind of psychiatrist out there could come up with a very interesting ruling on her adherence to this hand gesture she's always doing. Anyway, well, that's your 15 minutes of flame today. We covered a lot of ground. And again, just to round it all off so that uh, you have something to walk away with, this these are actually really important touch points in our human existence because there were things that came out like this 
certain points in time. Kathy O'Brien's book came out in, what was it, 2000? I think it might have been 2000. And it, Kathy O'Brien really blew up when the internet hit sort of this critical mass point. But there have been other books and other works and other people that have spoken out along the way in the 20s, the 30s, the 40s, the 50s, and their voices are distant echoes in the soundtrack of time, but they're still there. They're still there. This is present. This is current, and it is viral, and this is something that's actually quite important because there is a process of awakening that's taking place, and this is really a very critical and in some ways quite dangerous period in our history because as we awaken, then the other side is aware of the awakening. And like I said, they'll do anything they can to shut it down, which includes a war, by the way, if that's what it takes. So stay strong and keep awakening. Keep keep going, keep getting clearer and clearer and clearer. And I know sometimes daily life is difficult and we all have challenges and issues in our daily life that can be very daunting. But the more that you're on this side, I think the easier daily life can actually get because it gets clearer and clearer. You make choices that have to do with your own highest good and everything just becomes streamlined at that point. You're not fighting against yourself. You're not fighting against the tide. Your, your gifts, your innate gifts can come out and they can be brought into the world. And this is the type of world that we want to live in and support. So when you see somebody going through that process, support them. And if you see people that are struggling with their life and they're struggling with, you know, kind of this whole version of, of reality, support them. You know, you may want to send them a video or two every now and then. You know, you don't want to send them maybe the, the Merle Bauer stuff, but help them, nudge them, bring them over, you know, bring them over to the other side. Not everybody is a brain dead and mentally diseased uh, liberal or progressive who will not allow any kind of dialogue and just shut it down immediately and nurture that part of yourself as well that's the best we can do right now and uh, that's a in some ways a hard won love all right this is robert phoenix and you've been listening to 15 minutes of flame i'll be back tomorrow it's a little bit over time today but hey i think the content was worth it use your head to discern what's real your heart to say what's possible i'll see you 24 hours from now